And so today's topic um, is going to be a challenging one. And so I want to start off with a bit of fun for everybody. Um, we're going to have a vote today. Unlike the vote on Tuesday for president, this one doesn't have as much weight tied to it. We're going to do another vote, and I want everyone, no one's going to be too cool to not participate, all right? We want everyone's hand up. Um, there's two groups of people in this room. We have, this is a very divided topic that I'm going to bring up. It has to do with what is the appropriate time to start playing Christmas music in your home. Very divisive. Very divisive. And so I'm going to ask a few things. Don't raise your hand up, group number one, until I ask for a show of hands. But the first group of people in this room, you have already have 100.3 FM, Detroit's Christmas Station, or 98.7, The Breeze, or maybe iHeartRadio or something else, an app. But you have already locked in Christmas music in your home, in your car. And the reason for you is you love the season. You feel like if I play it for a few extra weeks longer, it just has a way of stretching out the Christmas season. How many of that's you? Hands up. Be proud. Hands really up. All right. Can we bring the lights up just a smidge too? That'd be great. I didn't see all that many hands. Maybe that's because there weren't that many. That's okay. Group number two. Don't raise your hands yet. But group number two is you feel like there's an order of things. There's an order of things. Thanksgiving first, then thou shalt play Christmas music. How many people are in that camp? Hands up, hands up, hands up. You need to know the same thing happened with the first service. There's room at the mission for both groups of people in this divisive topic. Um, and so I wanted to have some fun um, with that since this is be a challenging topic that I pray that we have an open mind. As, as you hear me preach. Um, I don't need to tell anybody that it was a big week. Uh, it's the day of the election turned into the week of the election. Um, last night, um, as I, I, I was preparing my sermon, and, and one of the candidates was declared the winner by the media, but it's not officially official yet. And so we honestly don't know how this is going to play itself out. Um, are we, are we going to have a new person in the Oval Office on January 20th of 2011? Or, or is this going to be a case of history repeating itself, like Dewey defeats Truman, right? Which was the front page, and everyone believed it for a little while. And then everything happened, and he didn't win. That's a great newspaper if you have. You're probably worth a lot of money. And we know this is just a crazy time for our country. There's going to be, I'm sure there's court battles and recounts and all that. And so we're going to see how it all shakes out. Please continue to pray, we'll, and, and we'll see what God does, right? But I want us to, right now, so today's November the 8th, I want us to fast forward beyond Christmas to January. And depending on who takes the oath of office on January 20th of 2021, some of you will be super happy about it, others of you will feel the exact opposite of that emotion. And because of all that's been going on in this, in our country, with the election season, uh, we've been in this series called A Refreshing Perspective on the Election. This is the grand finale sermon, the grand finale of the series. And the key word of this series title is refreshing. I truly pray this has given you a refreshing perspective on the election. And you need to know this as well, that I wrote the bulk of this sermon on Tuesday into Wednesday morning before all of the results started to really come in. And it was, it was very intentional that I had this message done, at least like the primary points done before the results started coming. And, and, and it's going to become clear as I preach why I did that. And so I have a question I'm going to ask. It's the title of my sermon. I'm going to ask it throughout the message, and I'm going to answer it every single time that I ask it in, in a number of ways. Here's the question. It's how now shall we live? With the election day in the rearview mirror, with, 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 while COVID is not, unfortunately, in the rearview mirror, with everything that's still upside down in our country and across the world, as believers and followers of Jesus, how now shall we live? Now, as we think about that question, as we think about the question of, well, how, how should we live right now? I want to give you a key thought. The marching orders that King Jesus gave 2,000 years ago did not change before or after the election. By the way, feel free, if you're an amener, to amen that. I'm going to try it again. No pressure. 
The marching orders that King Jesus gave 2,000 years ago did not change before or after the election. Amen. 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 Preach it. <laughs> Say it to myself. <laughs> As we think about that, the question again of how now shall we live, may we keep that key thought in mind. That the marching orders that Jesus our King, the marching orders he gave 2,000 years ago, did not change on November 3rd, before or after it. Now, what were those marching orders? Those marching orders were found in the final verse of the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew 28. It says, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And then King Jesus says, surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. That's the Great Commission. And those are the marching orders of the early church, and those marching orders have not changed. Those marching orders were not in effect only until November 3rd. And the outcome of the election does not make them null and void. When Jesus gave those marching orders, he did not really care who was Caesar in Rome. He didn't really care who was the Roman governor or the prefect, the governor of Israel, the Holy Land. And so I want to unpack what I just said, so you don't miss it. Again, when Jesus gave those marching orders, he didn't really care who was ruling Rome. He didn't care who was ruling even in his home land. So I want to take you back. We're going to hop in our time machine 2,000 years ago to the night before. Not the night before the election, but the night before the crucifixion, which is like what really matters. Amen. It's Thursday night. The night before Good Friday, Jesus just shared a final meal with his friends where he instituted the practice of Holy Communion, something we take every Sunday at our church. Jesus was betrayed by Judas, and while he was being arrested, he told Peter to put away a sword, not to fight. And then Jesus said these words, words that we need to hear today. And again, the Word of God is living and active and full of power. And so may these words speak to us Today, may we have fresh ears to hear them. Matthew 26, Jesus, King Jesus said, don't you realize that I could ask my father for thousands of angels to protect us and he would send them instantly. But if I did, how would the scriptures be fulfilled to describe what must happen now? A few hours later, after he says that to Peter, he's standing before Pontius Pilate, again, the Roman ruler, the local ruler, the prefect, the governor, and these words from Jesus amplify what he said to Peter. He said this to Pilate in John 18. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. Then Pilate, right, heard those words, said, all right, time to get you flogged. So Jesus was flogged. A crown of thorns was jammed on his head. He was being mocked. And then it says this in John chapter 19, next chapter. Why don't you talk to me, Pilate demanded of Jesus. He said, don't you realize that I have the power to release you or to crucify you? But Jesus said, listen to this, you would have no power over me at all unless it was given to you from above. And I want to share those scriptures because they point out some key truths. First of all, Jesus was king. And by the way, it's not was, he is still. And yes, he was going to bring the kingdom of God to earth. But the question is, how is he going to bring the rule and the reign of God to earth? How is he going to do that? How would King Jesus make his kingdom come and make his will be done on earth as it is in heaven? Because he could have done it any way he wanted to. Right? I mean, God in the flesh, all power, has legions of angels at his command. So he could have done it any way he wanted to. So how did he do it? When Jesus left heaven and came to earth, he did not arrive as a full-grown man like Adam. Like, boop, here I am. He could have done that. But instead he arrived 
as a baby. When he grew up, Jesus did not march into Rome and kick Caesar off the throne and take over the empire. He didn't do that. He could have done it that way, but he didn't. In fact, again, Jesus didn't seem to really care who was Caesar, who was emperor of Rome. He didn't care who was the Roman ruler of Israel, of, his, of the Holy Land. And what I just said is something that the closest followers of Jesus, the apostles, the disciples, they didn't get. They could not connect the dots that Jesus was trying to get them to connect. Because they thought for sure, they thought for sure that when the Messiah came, I mean, the top of his job description, kick Rome out of Israel. Top of his job description as the Messiah. So Jesus spent three years, 24-7, with a group of 12, plus other disciples as well. And he taught them about the, what the kingdom of God was like, again and again, but they still didn't get it. They could not wrap their minds around what God was doing. The disciples didn't even get it after the resurrection. Here's what they asked Jesus after he rose from the dead. Acts 1, verse 6. When the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? In other words, man, the whole crucifixion and the resurrection thing, that was a good plot twist. Didn't see that coming. But now, cool, that's great. Now it's time to grab our swords. Lord, they kept asking him. So like, I can picture them asking Jesus one time and he doesn't answer. Well, well hold on. Okay, maybe Jesus didn't understand because this is a point. This is why you're here, right? It's to kick Rome out of Israel. You're the Messiah, right? You have the power, right? You rose from the dead, right? Legions of angels. It's time to do it. And here's the response of King Jesus. Acts 1, starting the seventh verse. He replied to them, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, and in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This verse captures how our king, how King Jesus was going to make his kingdom come on earth. And these scriptures tell us that he was not going to do it through might or power. Instead, he was going to do it by love, by changing one heart at a time. See, when Jesus walked the earth, he didn't seem to care who was ruling in Rome, and he did not spend any time or energy trying to improve or change the reigning government of the day. Now, please don't send me emails Jesus couldn't vote. I'm very well aware of that, right? This is not a democracy, right? But the point is, he could have shown up and shown, all right, Caesar, whew, gone. You know, I'm king now. This throne, let me change it up. He could do whatever he wants to, but he didn't do it that way. Jesus did not spend any time or energy trying to improve or change the reigning government of the day. Instead, he focused on changing one heart at a time, one life at a time, one heart at a time, one life at a time. Here's what it says in Mark 1. The time promised by God has come at last that Jesus announced. He said, the kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. Now, Jesus did not say this after a new person became Caesar or emperor in Rome. He didn't say, the time will be then. He said, the time is now. And I want to share all those scriptures with you from the Gospels to Acts to remind us of all what Jesus did and what he didn't do when it came to advancing the kingdom of God on earth. And I pray that those scriptures paint a picture and help us realize things that we already know but are easy to forget when you watch your favorite cable news station or you listen to your favorite talk show radio host or your favorite YouTube host and all that. We need to remember that in the end, our call, the call in our lives to pursue Jesus is not ultimately affected by who is or isn't president. Just like, just like the earliest followers 
did not fix their eyes on who was Caesar or emperor in Rome. Just like the earliest Christians did not fix their eyes on who was Caesar in Rome, may we not fix our eyes on who's in Washington, D.C. or who isn't, but may we fix our eyes on King Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. So with all that in mind, with all that in mind now, I want to get very practical and say, okay, well, with all that in mind, with all that, all that scripture as our foundation, how now shall we live? Regardless, again, of how, when all the smoke clears with the election and all legal battles are done, no matter who ends up taking the oath of office on January 20th of 2021, how now shall we live? As believers and followers of Jesus, how now shall we live? And when I mean how now shall we live, I mean how now, not how, depending on who wins January 20th, you know, who gets elected, it's not, it's not that. How now shall we live? So here's some action steps. And these all focus on what you can do, things that are in your control right now, in your context. This is first, it's like a super action step, and then I'm going to break it down. Here's the action steps, plural. What do we do? How now shall we live? Strengthen yourself in the Lord. Strengthen your friendships. Strengthen your family. Strengthen your local church. Strengthen your local community. That's, again, five ways, five things we can do in our power and our ability, right, with the power of the Holy Spirit, right, obviously, but things we can do, choices we can make, and how we choose to spend our time, ways we use to spend our words, actions we choose to do. And so I want to take that big action step and break it down one by one, and I'm going to touch on a few of these just briefly and then camp out on a few other ones. The first part of this action step is to strengthen yourself in the Lord. And that was my sermon last Sunday about King David and what he did when his world crumbled before him, what he did. He strengthened himself in the Lord. So if you did not hear my sermon, we love everyone to come to church every single Sunday. I know it's not always possible. So online, check it out. You can go to the mission.church, our homepage, click on the media tab and watch the sermon, watch, watch the live stream as it is replayed. That's all I want to say about that one. So go back to last week, strengthen yourself in the Lord. That's your first answer of how now shall we live. Start with you and then go outward. The next thing to do is to strengthen your friendships. Strengthen your friendships. This is a snapshot of the early church and the importance of community. This is in Acts 2, parts of three verses, starting in the 42nd verse. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. It says, all the believers were together, and every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. So we often talk about, and we need to, right, we need to have a personal relationship with Jesus. We need to individually accept him as Lord and Savior for our sins, right? We need to do that. But as we do that, there's also this aspect of our communal relationship with Jesus, right? We are meant to live out our faith in community. And so how now shall we live regardless of who is president come January? How now shall we live? By strengthening our friendships. And what's true is that since COVID hit, we have had to fight hard against isolation. And it's been a struggle. It's been a real struggle to stay connected to people. Even take the, take the election season and put it on the shelf, right? If it was just COVID itself, boy, oh boy. Pile the election on top of that and everybody sees things the same way. Unfriend, unfriend, unfriend. <laughs> I'm not gonna call you. Can't believe you're vote. Can't believe you're gonna vote for the other person. Obviously, it's gonna usher in the end of the world as we know it, right? That's all of our approaches. So it's been a struggle. It's been a struggle to fight against isolation. The devil, the devil, his plan is to isolate, to divide. And so we need to battle against that. We are in a spiritual battle. And so I want to make this action step very, very practical, very doable. So here is how I landed when it comes to strengthening your friendships. It's strengthen your friendships by reaching out seven times in seven days. 
Now, I'm going to do the math for you. That's one person per day. Make it easy. One person per day. So I would love for you right now, does Holy Spirit do this? Maybe you, you, you write the names in your program, or you just, just come to mind. The Holy Spirit will bring to mind right now, because right? God still speaks to us. A list of people, brainstorm a list of people that you miss seeing, people you miss talking to, as well as maybe people you are still connecting with, but you love to go deeper with them in your relationship, in your friendship. You love to connect even more. And so brainstorm a list. And again, if a name or a face comes to mind that maybe surprised you, write it down, capture it. And then reach out, just make a commitment between now and church next Sunday. I'm going to reach out to one person each day on my list. And maybe you choose to reach out to some of them by picking up the phone, making a phone call, checking in on them. Maybe you email someone or you text someone to invite them out for a coffee or maybe you go out to breakfast or a lunch. However you do it, do it. And this, by the way, is a two-way street, right? We all, love, we all love to be pursued. It feels good to be pursued. But we need to be the ones also doing the pursuing. It is a two-way street. And so I hope that this matters enough to you not to be passive, but to be active, to take action, and not to wait for community to happen, but to be a catalyst to be the one making community happen. I would love, again, for people to be like halfway, like you're about to pick up the phone to call someone when your phone rings from that person. You're like, oh my gosh, I was just about to call you. I mean, God's totally in this. And that we would be meeting halfway. So how now shall we live? How now shall we live? By strengthening yourself in the Lord, by strengthening your friendships. Here's the third way. Regardless of who is in the White House come January, Strengthen your family. Strengthen your family. God created family, right? Family was God's idea. And the devil and our culture are trying to rip families apart, to divide us. And so what are some practical ways, both with your words and your actions, that you, you can strengthen your family? What are some ways you can bless and honor your parents, your siblings, your children, your spouse, your grandparents, maybe members of your extended family. What are some ways that you can do that? Just a quick side note. This coming Monday is the quote-unquote anniversary of the passing of my mom, of Grandma Cop, November 9th. She died November 9th of 2017, so three years ago. And I'm so thankful my, my dad passed away two years before she did of pancreatic cancer. Stage four pancreatic cancer hit him out of nowhere in 2015. And so just, just to be real, when, when I was in seminary out in California back in 1999, I would say I had a very obligatory relationship with my mom and dad at the time. Like we would dial in every Friday it was, we used Skype, which back 20 years ago, the technology was absolutely horrible. It calls, calls to drop, but it was free, so that's how, that's how we rolled as, as a cop family. Free phone calls are good. Let's do Skype. But, but to be honest, I didn't really have a relationship with my mom and dad at that time. It was an obligation, like, to do the Skype call every Friday. If we missed a call, I wouldn't follow up with them on Saturday. I'll, I'll just check you next week. I, I was busy or whatever. And that's just where I was. That's just where I was. And then Kelly and I, thankfully, got married in 2004. And I realized the relationship Kelly had with her extended family. Her grandma and papa, her, her siblings. It was a good Italian Catholic family, right? They got, they, they got that going for them. And... They just had a really neat family connection. And no one knew at the time that prior to our second anniversary, Kelly's dad would have passed away and her grandpa and grandma would have passed away. All prior to our two-year anniversary. And as I'm at those funerals and as I'm just grieving for her, for the family, I had this wake-up call where I found myself, and this was like an interesting just exercise. I started calling my mom and dad like a lot. And I realized, why am I calling my mom? Like, I never call my mom and dad, right? Why am I calling them? This is, again, 04. 
And I realized just through prayer that God's saying, they're still alive, which means there's still time to enter into the tunnel of chaos that family can be. Can I get an amen? <laughs> and to, you know, it's clunky at times, whatever, but to pick up that phone and, and to connect. And so thankfully, thankfully, right, God can bring good things out of any bad thing. doesn't cause the bad, but he can bring good out of, out of, out of the bad, right? And so for 12 years, it took a little bit of time, but for 12 years, I actually had a friendship. And it went from being an obligation thing to something I pursued, they pursued. And at the time, we had no idea that it would only be 12 years. No idea back in 04 that my dad would be at his funeral in 2015 and then two years after that with my mom. And so I, I just, I felt the nudge at the first service, felt the same nudge, was one of those Holy Spirit get, get off the page moments in my message. But I don't know how that speaks to you in your context, but I want to encourage you, the devil loves it when relationships that are destroyed remain destroyed. When relationships are broken, remain broken. The devil loves it when we isolate. The devil loves it when we just feel a good old dose of the spirit of offense and we're roommates with the spirit of offense and we just allow that offense to give us nice hard hearts and not take any action. So let me just encourage you, as I said that, if there's some emotion you're feeling, as you're feeling my emotion, and there's a relationship, there's a friendship, there's a connection, maybe it's in your family, maybe it's some other relationship, reach out. And if they hang up on you the first time, don't go, hey, I tried that. Try it again. Do whatever it takes. May the Holy Spirit lead you in that. Strengthen your family. Here's an anchor scripture of this part of my sermon. Psalm 133. This is the C-E-B translation. Look at how good and pleasing it is when families live together as one. So again, what are some practical ways with words and actions you can strengthen your family, your extended family? And you know what? We can do that regardless of who sits in the Oval Office. Fourth approach of how to live, how now shall we live, strengthen your local church. The mission. Regardless again of how the election finally ends up, when all the dust settles and all the court battles are done, right? Strengthen your local church. Here's the thing. If every church did this in America, around the world, it'd be a game changer. It'd be a game changer. Strengthen your local church where you are rooted and planted. And so, if you were one of those people back in June that could not wait, we were closed down for 13 Sundays, didn't see that one coming, right? We opened up in middle of June. But if you were one of those people that like, couldn't wait for church to reopen, we ask, we want to invite you to consider standing in the gap to help make church happen. This is true for every church across the country. There are members on volunteer teams, right? Church would not exist without an army of volunteers every single Sunday. Simply wouldn't. And so there are people that aren't, don't feel comfortable for coming back just yet, and so we want people to stand in the gap. It's a great way to meet people. It's a great way to get connected. It's a great way to strengthen friendships by serving together. The Apostle Paul wrote this to the early church, to the church of Corinth. He said, now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And so every local church needs every part of the body functioning to help make church happen. It's really as simple as that. Here's a key thought. The church was not meant to be an audience, but an army. And our church is stronger when everybody is engaged, when nobody is on the sidelines just watching. And so, right, so church on Sundays, right, I'm the mouth right now of the body, Right? <laughs> Got a big one, too. Come on. Right? Well, th this is not the epitome of our faith, right? We come here, like we say, we want you to encounter God. And I pray you do that 
in the worship. I pray you do that right now as I'm preaching, as we take communion, as we pray that you encounter God, that you get equipped in your faith. You get equipped in your faith so that you can go on, you can engage the world, encounter, equip, engage, that you then can engage the world with the love of God by the power of the Holy Spirit, right? So this, I see every Sunday, it's kind of like the halftime speech of a game. Where you come here, you get poured into, you get reminded of what's true. You get reminded of who's king. That's right. And help make it happen. So five ways to make it happen, to make church happen. There'll be a slide on the screen. And if you have your connection card, we ask you all to pull it out. And on the back of it, there are ways to volunteer. Again, we would love to invite you. So our, our kids wing, right, which it was awesome seeing all the littles walking by here, right? Babies, preschoolers, and toddlers this week, thanks to an army of volunteers helping make that happen. Then we're going to open up another classroom next Sunday and then a, another classroom at the end of November. And so the plan is all the way from babies through elementary will be open in a few weeks with an army of volunteers. And so that's something, if you want, you can check, ch check the kids box there and we'll follow up with you. Also, we have an awesome team for medical. And the medical team is, okay, this is not like, hey, I watched ER for a number of years. It's, no, you have training in a medical profession. We would love to, to have you volunteer. Again, hoping that you do nothing every Sunday. But let me tell you, when it came, when it, when it came to my mom and also my dad, right, and a few others at the church, we needed the medical, we needed the medical team to, to step up when, when incidents happened, right? And so thank you for the medical team, right? It's awesome. Usher greeter team, right? You don't need a degree for this one. You just need to love people, which is everyone's job description as Christians. And so if, you're, if, you're, if you want to join the usher greeter team, it's helping make the, first, the best first impression possible. You're the one, they're the ones opening the doors for you, helping people find seats, getting them just welcomed at the church, right? When it comes to the worship team, we would love to add vocalists, musicians to our camera crew, to our soundboard team, to our slideshow team and security team, right? Your job behind the scenes to make sure everyone feels safe from the front to the back of the building. So what the invitation is to make it sustainable is we ask people to do one, one, one. Pick one team, serve at one service, once a month. Pick one team, serve one time, once a month. And so again, on the back of your connection card, you can check a box, check a few of them. This is not a blood covenant. This is not a 10-year commitment. It's simply to start a conversation that we will then connect you with the team leader, have you try it out on Sunday, and see how it goes. All right? And then, by the way, your connection card, drop it in the orange buckets, which is the way we do the offering right now on your way out. So four ways, four ways so far. How do we, how now shall we live? Strengthen yourself. You strengthen your friendship, strengthen your family, strengthen your local church, and then strengthen your local community. What this one is about is about serving beyond the walls of our church. Someone said this phrase, and at the time she said it, I don't think she realized it was a prophecy, but I believe it is a prophecy for the church. She said this. She said, the reason the walls of this church exist is that so we can go beyond them. The reason the walls of our church exist are that so we can go beyond them. So the question is, how is God inviting you to join him in what he is doing to make his kingdom come more fully on earth in our local community, to make his will be done more completely on earth in our local community as it is in heaven? That you would ask God to give you eyes to see how to help those who need help. Going back to the Gospel of Matthew, says this in chapter 25, then the king, King Jesus, will say to those on his right, he will say, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom of prayer for you since the creation of the world. For I, King Jesus says, I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was, in, I was sick and you came to look after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And they're like, Lord, wait, when did you do any of that stuff? We, we didn't do that to you. And then it says, the king will reply, 
Truly I tell you, whatever you did to one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. So how is God calling you to show his love in practical ways? How is God calling you to live out your faith? How is God calling you to help those who need help? Sometimes it can be part of something we're doing at the church that's on the vine, like, like the Friends of Foster Kids, as an example, right? Operation Christmas Child, as an example. Or it's just wherever you're at in your own neck of the woods, in your neighborhood, as you go about your day, as you're grocery shopping, as you're at work. How is King Jesus inviting you to be his hands and his feet and his mouth? to a hurting and broken world. So there's a number of ways you could do this and other ways for you to consider, but we have a video that we want to show you of something that we want to invite and we really hope every household at the church takes us up on. So let's take a look at this opportunity. Let's watch this video. Hey everyone, I am inside the nursery in our kids wing and I'm so excited that as of November the 1st, it is reopened on Sundays during the 11 a.m. service. And so if you have a baby, if you have a, a toddler, if you have a preschooler, bring them to the mission and just do that. Let's, let's build this kids ministry back now that we're reopened. And I'm also super excited that I'm, I'm right next to here, Jessica Brandenburg. She's our brand new director of Mission Kids. This position has been open for 10 months, and the Holy Spirit absolutely brought the right person for the job for a time such as this. I am so excited and honored to be here. This is an awesome church. It's, it, it is. Yeah, I'm, again, I'm so excited at what is coming on the horizon for kids' ministry. And in addition to the passion that she has for kids' ministry on Sundays, she also has a passion to go beyond the walls of the church and to show God's love in practical ways to our community. And so why don't you tell us a little bit about an idea that we have that we're going to do as a church. So this month in November, we are talking about how God gives us food. And the kids on Sunday made these adorable little shakers. They got to put uh, food stickers all around them, and um, they're kind of fun. Absolutely. Um, and it really got me thinking about how there are so many families that because of COVID are struggling with food insecurity. And, you know, what are some ways that we can be the church, how we can uh, really show God's love to those outside these walls? And so we are going to have a food drive. Yeah, and so we reached out to Smyrna's House Food Pantry just a few miles off the road from where our church building is. And we asked them what are the greatest needs they have to help stock their food pantry. And so we got a list, and we're going to make that available to everybody. And so what I love about this as a food drive is, first of all, on the back of the vine, there's a black and white uh, ver ver version of, of this sheet that you can then, again, grab a stack of 10 or 20 or 30 of these, as many as you want to, and it's done at your convenience in your neighborhood. And so this is something that, that you can do when it's most convenient for you. And we have a, some instructions to follow. If you've never done a food drive, how to do it in a nice, easy way. And what's really cool is this is something that we don't want just someone to do by themselves, do we? No, not at all. We want that, this to be something that the entire family can do. It's a great opportunity for you to be able to get out there, meet your neighbors, say hi to them, get to interact with them, show them God's love, and also invite your kids to come along. It's something the entire family can do. Absolutely. And so what, what we're saying, church, is today grab a stack of flyers, grab the instructions, and then over the next couple of weeks, when it's convenient for you, walk your neighborhood, ring some doorbells, meet some neighbors, and then maybe a few days after that, to pick the food up, bring everything back on Sunday, November 22nd, and then we will take everything just to Samaritan's house. And again, this is a way to help those who need help and show God's love in practical ways. So thanks so much for doing this, church. We are gonna bless people just in amazing ways, all for God's glory. Thanks so much. Thank you. Here. Awesome. All right. And so, yeah, so just to amplify that action step a little bit, on your way out, we have a stack, again, of these flyers. It's two-sided. We printed, I think, 300 of these. So, again, take as many as you want to. The only thing we ask you to write out is your neighbors from the Mission Church will pick up your items from your front porch. Make sure you fill that date in. We are asking everyone, so, again, to bring them here on November 22nd. And so do that maybe the 21st or before November 22nd. Um, and then bring them here on a Sunday. And again, you can grab a stack of these. The backside has all the needs specifically that we reached out to Samaritan's House to ask them. So again, grab a stack of these flyers on your way out. There's a table. There's also an instruction sheet 
it's really this only like one per household. It's like, how do you do it? When you do it, it's all, all the questions you might have. And again, we want people to do this as a family, as a household. And then in addition to that, this is also one per family. It's an orange sheet about talking to your kids about food insecurity for all ages and then age specific ways. And so again, this is an opportunity. I really love this because not only will this help strengthen our local community, but it also will strengthen our church as we do this, as we honor Jesus, as we do this for Jesus, and also strengthens us individually, and it strengthens our families. And again, we can do this no matter who is president, right? So we had a big election this week, and it's turned into election week. And again, regardless of when the dust clears, who will take the oath of office on January 20th of next year? Regardless of the outcome of the election, how now shall we live? And the answer to that question is to do what Jesus did. It's always a good example. What did Jesus do? Let's do that. When he walked the earth, and he didn't seem to care who was ruling in Rome. He didn't seem to care who was ruling in Israel. Instead, he focused on changing one heart, one life at a time, and may we do the same. May we follow Jesus and do the same. May we, how now shall we live? Strengthen ourselves, strengthen our friends, strengthen our family, strengthen our local church, and strengthen our local community. May, as we do all that, as we do all that, may we not fix our eyes on the president, but may we fix our eyes on our king, on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. And so as we wrap up our series that we launched five weeks ago, I pray that the series accomplished what I pray that it set out to do, that this series removed fear, that the series provided hope, and this series reminded us who reigns regardless of who is president. Amen. Amen.